Kia ora, my name's Neil O'Reilly. I'm principal as Perry said at Cowland Junior School. I used to be at Waitakere School in Christchurch, um, and I'm not anymore. I'm here. Lovely to be back in New Zealand. So, um, to cut to the chase, um, especially for those of you who are here before, the eight key components to creating an effective, collaborative teaching and learning environment are these ones behind me. And I probably can't, I could spend a whole day just talking about the two in orange because it seems to me that those two in orange are most misunderstood, and particularly about student-centeredness. I'm amazed um, when I started to talk around the country about my, my research, how many people really misunderstood what being student-centered meant. Um, and back then we weren't talking about agency in a big way, but if, if you're a PYP school, it's about having agency at the center. So my, my wondering, the conversation I'd like you to have to start is, what does student-centered learning and what does a student-centered school mean to you? What would be some indicators of a student-centered school? Can you have a chat with the people next to you about that? What would be some indicators of a student-centered school and a student-centered classroom? Have a chat. You've chatted about it. I'm not necessarily wanting the answers back, but a bit like for the people who were here before when we were talking about what effective pedagogy is, my challenge to you is, that if you and your staff don't have some shared beliefs and understandings about what student-centeredness means, I can guarantee that it'll mean very different things across your school. And when I spoke with um, schools around the country and spoke with teachers and they said, we're a student-centered, we, I have a student-centered classroom, I was amazed at how many things were actually teacher-centric, such as a timetable that's more convenient for the teacher because she, wants, she or he wanted learning to happen in these slots, such as the walls, which were displayed and chosen for by the teacher, such as how the classroom worked and the way that the conduct that would go on in the classroom that was predominantly chosen by the teacher, such as who should speak in the room, which was usually chosen by the teacher, such as who would do most of the talking in the room was usually the teacher. So much of what we do subconsciously as teachers is actually teacher-centric. And I don't think we need to make it a bad thing. We just need to put it on the table and say, if we're trying to create a student-centered environment, we really need to unpack what that might look like, feel like, and sound like. And the reason for that is that if you don't have shared understandings about that, when you start to bring people together to collaborate, and particularly to co-teach in one space, man, it stands out like a bad sore where one teacher who thought they were student-centered is actually teacher-centered, and their main job they have is to control children and control children's behavior. And ultimately what we're after is self-regulated learners or agentic learners, students who are leading their own learning. It's critically important that you as a staff and at your school you unpack what that means, because once again, otherwise your vision statement is just gobbledygook. It's like when you have a vision statement that says we b believe in student-centered learning or we believe in this, that, and the other thing, and then you send home homework, which basically says we believe in doing reading, writing, maths, and silly projects. So we're gonna have a real close look at the practice that's going on in our classes and cut through all the other stuff and get down what's happening for our children in our classroom. Indicators of student-centeredness to me would be children talking with each other, so a talk-to-learn environment that children would be involved in planning, that children would be given feedback about the learning, that children would be involved and have an agreement about what goes up around the room. I mean, who decides to put my piece of art as a student up on a wall? Because if it's the teachers, that's not a student-centered environment. That's a teacher-centered environment. When I was at school, I used to feel great about my art until it went up on the wall next to someone else's Monet. <laughs> Whose environment is it? So I think it's really important for you if you want to make the shift to co-teaching practice, to have some really serious conversations with your staff and get them to have conversations about what does student-centered look like, feel like, and sound like in our school. So, is the job of a teacher humanly possible? Now, I've been watching with interest from afar about the pay claim going through. Poor labor. After all these years, they get to do all the work. So I've been watching with interest, and I thought, well, that's great. They got the money. Did they get the money in the end or not? Yes or no? Teachers did. You guys, not so much? So, not at all. Is having more money, and I know it's important they do, but will having more money make the job less stressful for teachers? 
Is it going to make them better at their job? Is it going to make it better for children? Now, I've got no doubt in my mind that money is well deserved. But when I watched from afar and I saw the headlines, I thought, you know, such celebration over money. I thought, yeah, that's great. That is really great. But I wonder if it's actually going to curb the tide of teacher loss and teacher stress and teacher burnout. Because I suspect the way we do the job isn't humanly possible. And I'm intrigued by that. I was intrigued because it seems to me since I was teaching, all of these things have happened. Does anyone remember handwriting reports? And what happened if you made one mistake? <laughs> Start again. Handwritten reports. No generic comments, and we had to do it for 30 to 35 children. So what's happened? What's made the job worse? What's made it harder? What's making it impossible for our teachers? Now, I did some guessing, so correct me if I'm wrong, because I've been out of the country for a couple of years, but I noticed that this was a big factor. I wondered if this is a big factor. I wonder if this is a big factor. I wonder if teachers are in meetings too flipping off and wasting their time talking about stuff they don't need to talk about. I wonder if this is a factor. Wasn't technology supposed to make our lives easier? Pinterest, man. Is release time making it easier or harder? Disconnecting with children, I don't know. What's making it harder, and I suspect what's making it harder is the fact that we're not collaborate, collaborating well together. We need to find out better ways of working together. And I've talked about this with the earlier group. I think what we need to do is suss out how we think in our groups, because when you have people thinking from different perspectives and you're sitting down around this table of five wonderful teachers, they all come from different perspectives and they don't know why, and they get really slacked off with each other, particularly these two gentlemen here. Tony thinks Hamish is an absolute twat because he comes out with this stuff that's always, he's always saying, yeah, but what about the data, what about the data? And Tony's saying, look, I just want to know what's good for kids. And this feels good to me. And they come from different perspectives and they don't really value each other's point of view because they don't realize where that point of view is coming from. So part of the work that we can do to help our teachers be less stressed is to help them understand more about how they think. And this is what amazes me. If teachers don't understand how other adults think, then how do I understand how children think? And they've got 30 or more of them. And that children come from different perspectives. So, it is possible to make the job easier. And in my experience, when people went into flexible learning environments and all those other letters, we'll just pick flexible learning environments for now, the first two years were harder work. And after two years, when people started to work smarter and understand how to work with other adults and work together in a space, the job got easier. And they stopped doing all the work on their own. So, here's what I suggest could happen if you're collaborating effectively. And I'd like you to discuss them after I pop them up. Perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't do all the planning as a group. Perhaps we could do that separately. Perhaps we all don't have to do the things that come up across our schools throughout the year. Perhaps we could share those. Perhaps we could work to our strengths, and God forbid, as a teacher, say, you know, I'm not particularly flash at that, and someone else in the team offered to do it, and vice versa. Perhaps we should develop our skills in communication for working with one another as adults, and stop trying to make our teams our best friends. Because actually, you weren't employed to have best friends at school. You're employed to work with children. And if you happen to get a best friend out of it, kate pie, that's cool, but that's not why we put you there. And perhaps we can engage teams in short-term projects to improve what's happening at our school so they feel empowered that they're making the change at the school. Because when teachers make the change and they're given the time and the license, they feel less stressed because it's stuff that they've initiated. And perhaps if we empower our students more, then our teacher's job would be less difficult. And perhaps we need to have some protocols about stop flipping communicating with each other, particularly in the evenings and over the weekends, and get our job to be in a reasonable time frame. I'd like you to have a chat about those and then just give me some feedback. I added one at the bottom, which I realize isn't easy, but I also wonder um, if part of the stress that teachers have is because they take those beautiful things home that cause them such stress in their lives 
and they're trying to do their work in the evenings until all hours of the evenings. I wonder, I wonder maybe if we said, you know, just stay at school to a certain time and finish your work and then you don't have to do any more. Bottom line is a teacher's job can never end, a bit like a principal's job, eh? But what happens if you just stop? What happens if you just say enough is enough? Because it appears to me that despite the fact that teachers will say they're working longer and working harder, well, it doesn't appear to me, the data would suggest that not much is improving for our kids. So maybe we should invert that, work less and see if that gets better. But it's certainly worth the conversation that the time our teachers are putting into working, and particularly when they're working on their own, is that valuable time. Okay, I'm gonna jump forward for those of you who weren't here for the first session. Here's what I suggest needs to be your building blocks in a school if you want the best possible outcome for your children. And I suspect that most schools haven't really got this one nailed, so that's not in the mix. They usually don't have this one nailed. And unfortunately, one-to-one -one devices and what goes on with technology, despite hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment, this one's not working too well. So as long as we've got effective pedagogy and shared belief trust, we should be okay for our kids. But I wonder if we've even got those in place. So the question I ask myself, and I challenge you, is have you got shared beliefs and understanding? So I tested myself when I got to the new school and we set up a question about what success for every child was. Two years later, we surveyed the parents, and I don't know about here in New Zealand, but man, to get feedback in Hong Kong from parents is hard. Is it hard here? Yeah? The first week I had a 16% response rate from my parents, and I remember we had 900 children at the school. 16% to give it, sorry, 16 parents on an online survey to give us feedback about where we're on the right track and you can have some say in how the school is going forward. So I pestered them through social media and I pestered them, so we got an 84% response rate and we had 100% said that they understand and believed in the visions and values and commitments of our school. And as I said earlier, we broke it down to five key aspects about success, achievement, agency, respect, opportunity and well-being. And our parents said, yep, we buy into that and our staff buy into it, all of our staff. So our foundation is in place, I'm fairly confident of that. Our effective pedagogy is not there yet, but we're nailing it down about what quality teaching and learning looks like, feels like, and sounds like at our school. And that's gonna be an ongoing process and we're documenting it through our Google site so everyone can have access to it, but it's an organ organic process. Our teacher collaboration, so we use HBDI, we use the norms of collaboration, and we use agenda protocols for every single meeting we have so that we can maximize our meeting time. Shorter meetings, if you make things time poor, you actually get a better result. So if your meetings are normally an hour and a half long, your professional learning meetings, cut them down. Make it shorter, you'll be amazed at what you achieve. And in 30 days, as I told you earlier, our staff achieved more in 30 days than they had in six to 10 months because they felt time for, but they also had a little bit of time to work professionally. Resources and space, so we got schooling improvement teams to figure out how we use those most effectively in our school. And they are making significant changes right across our school. And our vision is very clear to us. So, for yourselves, have a look at that and have a conversation about where you're at in that checklist of things if you want the best your children's achievement, your vision for your school to be up here rather than down here. Where are you at with those building blocks? Have a chat with the people around you. Co-teaching, which is what I did most of my research about. Um, the school we're at now isn't particularly co-teaching a lot. Although they have a stunning environment for it, instead of at Waitakere School where we had 110 children in a shared space like this with four or five breakout areas, at Kowloon Junior School, they've got five classrooms down the side and a beautiful shared space in between. So arguably, they could be into it, but I purposely did not invite them to get into co-teaching because they didn't have this sussed out. And they didn't have this sussed out. And in fact, they didn't even know how to work well as teams. And I figured putting teachers into that sort of environment, so just chucking them into co-teaching without having the foundation in place is actually experimenting with our kids and messing with our staff's stress levels. So we've waited, so I'm two years into the job and this next year is when we're really gonna to start to get into opportunities to co-teach because the adults know how to work together better. I don't think a lot has changed since I've been away. There's just not a rush. 
just take our time to make sure we've got the foundations in place so that our staff and our children can be successful. And there's an arrow going to come up there to prove that that's true. See? When you've got your shared beliefs and understandings sorted, then you can start to do some really cool stuff with teachers working together. Even just putting together our teams, so our teaching teams of five teachers per year group, is a very open and clear process designed to enhance collaboration. So what we say to them is we're going to look at our student needs, we're going to look at your HBDI profile, we're going to look at your experience, your expertise and your passions, we're going to look at your personal preference, and then the team dynamics. And what we put together looks complex, but what it allows us to do is build a team that has some people who are deeply relational, some people who are very clear systems thinkers, some people who are highly analytical, and in primary schools, that's not many, and some people who love having the beautiful big ideas. And when we put our teams together, we then sort out the tough dynamics that come. Now, if your teams are working in perfect harmony, then there's something not right. Because an effective team should have some grit, it should have some disagreement, it should have some banter going on. Hopefully though, we're talking professional and not personal, which is when we need to come back to our agreements about how we work together as adults. And that allows us to make a team, what I'm most concerned about is achieving our school vision, is I want these people to be able to work together and collaborate in a way that's going to make learning better for children. Not that's going to make them happiest. Does that sound fair? Which means that we're really open about the process and when people do come together and they find their team's not gelling, they at least understand why they've been put in that situation. And we support them to get there so we don't leave them in the deep end. So, what could you start, stop, what has you wondering about team composition? Have a chat about that. My suggestion to you is that, or the, the feedback from the participants in my research, research said that they needed skill development to work together. And here's just one example of how you might do it. And I mentioned to the group earlier, it could be you use the Balbum teamwork profile, it could be DISC, it could be Myers-Briggs, but something that helps people to be able to perceive why the person and their team always comes from a totally different perspective. And then it need not be personal, it can be professional, but understanding their point of view. So at the start of the year, we set up a number of protocols to help the teams to understand one another better. Because ultimately, we want them to gel. We don't want them smashing head to head, because it's so important for our children. We also set up protocols for sharing the passions and skills and interests and strengths that each of our team members brings to their team. Because we want to utilize that. One of the things I don't want in our school is flatlining because we're doing things in the same way. I want the passion to be evident in the team meetings so that that can infuse all of the classrooms. The challenge with a single classroom or a lack of collaboration is a single teacher's passion just happens for a few children. Why wouldn't we be sharing that across our school? Why wouldn't we be making the experience for our children better right across the school rather than they just happen to luck into a great class? We heard a little bit about growth mindset this morning. When I was doing this work with teachers, I was challenged about how much they asked children to have growth mindset and how much they didn't have it themselves. So I think there's an opportunity there for us to model with our teachers and, with our, and our staff about what growth mindset means as an adult before we, have to ask, before we start asking the children to have a growth mindset. And what strategies do you have in place to allow people to figure out where they're at on the growth mindset continuum. Because you're not one place or another. You tend to waver and it depends what you're doing impacts your mindset. And I think that's really important for children to know that teachers are modeling the practice that you're asking them to do in the classroom. We have, I'm going to feel like the protocol man, but when we get our teachers to, to, together to collaborate, we want to make sure we get good outcomes. So we have protocols for our meetings. Instead of having an agenda item, it's an essential question, because that's what we should be there for. The little narrow column used to say D for discussion or D for dialogue, but they both were D. I'm not sure what they're putting in there now. But it's really important to know, are you going into this next period in our meeting to have a discussion, which results in a decision, or dialogue, which results in deeper understanding? And at everything we talk about, let's finish it and zip it up. And let's have another rule. Close your jolly laptops. Not, not you people now, sorry. 
Can I have a show of hands who thinks it's possible to multitask? Come on, be brave. Mm. We well, you know what the brain science says you're wrong. You can't multitask. You can rapidly monotask, so flip from one thing to another, but as long as your team, when they're trying to collaborate, as long as they all have their laptops up and you're having a discussion, if someone's got their key fingers on the keyboard, you can guarantee they're not present. So have some rules, have some agreements. Close the laptop because we want everyone to engage in some dialogue. And then when we reach the gray bit, which is are we ready for a decision, we come back to our seven norms and we have a clarifying paraphrase and say, is this what we've agreed to? Katie Pai, write it up on one, everyone can see it, we're all done. Be really productive with the time where we're going to put people together. We always have a check-in rather than just coming after work and getting straight into a meeting. I challenged the staff at Waitakere School that going from um, school and finishing at three o'clock straight into a meeting is not a very clever idea. And Nathan McCarty Wallace tells us there's four things that activate our um, brains. Can you remember what they are? The four things that release endorphins into the brain that help us to learn better. Exercise, laughter, singing, and relationships. So I figured they're not going to finish the day and sing a song. They're not going to finish the day and have a hug before the meeting. They could do some movement. So my challenge is if we believe that the brain works best when it's stimulated by one of those four things, how about before you go into meetings, you just have a protocol that we walk once around the field. Or we do something to take us from that physical space we're in and get us into a new space so that we can be focused on what we need to do next. So protocols, protocols, protocols to make the most of the time. I haven't got it here, and I should have, but every meeting there should be a visible agenda. That stops the detailed people thinking, well, what's coming next and when is it going to be done? Because if it's up on the wall there, they can see it and then they don't need to continually refer back to the laptop, which takes them out of the meeting. There should be time estimates, although I'm crap at this. There should be time estimates about how long you're going to spend on each item so that you can get through the stuff on your agenda and put the stuff at the top that's most important and dump the other stuff. We'll do it some other way, but get it out of a collaborative meeting. If it's not about children's learning, if at all possible, don't meet about it. Laptops down, I've talked about. Seven norms of collaboration. So at the beginning of all of our meetings, our team set a seven norms target and the staff members share what theirs is. So I'm going to paraphrase more, or I'm going to pose data. I think one of the things that does the most damage at collaborative meetings in schools is teachers generalising. So today the kids were useless. None of my kids learned that. Oh, they didn't get it. There's no such thing. Ask your teachers to be really data driven. I don't mean numbers, but four or five of my children were really struggling with that concept today. Because when we use global statements, what it does is it brings a whole meeting down and everyone starts to feel flat. Because someone says, oh, my kids just don't get it. Or my kids don't understand. Like you've got one class of kids who are particularly thick. So get people to use data, go back to the seven norms if you want effective collaborative practice. And last but not least, at the end of the meeting, review the meeting. How successful was it in achieving the goals that you had set out? If you want to enhance collaboration in your school, if you want things to be better, then you need to talk about how successful the meeting was and whether or not you achieved your goals. And that way you can improve your meetings on an ongoing basis. How about this one? What do you do with people at a meeting who are a bit like me, who like to talk a lot? Can I have a show of hands either in your middle leadership, senior leadership or staff meeting who's got a staff member that immediately comes to mind that loves to talk? Yeah? And keep your hand up if it's you. No. So how do you deal with the talkers? And there's so many different ways that you can deal with the talkers, which is why protocols really help, just like you would with students. Why wouldn't you use this for staff to stop and shut up and think and then peer and then share? And there's no discussion on this. This is how we do our meetings. Our staff meetings at Cowlin Junior School, which we have about every three weeks, professional learning meetings, don't have any talkers who take over because they haven't got the opportunity. Because there's protocols in place to make sure that they don't. First word, last word is another great protocol. Pick up a reading, 
have the first person read it and, and then go right around the group without any comment and the last person, the first person gets to comment again on what everyone thought about the reading. <coughs> two, four, eight, two people talk, join up with another two, make a four, join up with another two, make an eight and have a conversation together. The one I like best though, to stop the talker, and this really concerns some of my staff, so our team, as I mentioned, are five, and one team, they've got one particular person who just talks non-stop, and I said, that's fine. At the start of next year, institute a team observer for all your meetings. That person has no talking rights for the whole meeting. She said, but isn't that, well, how's that gonna work? She might have some great ideas. I said, she's probably got great ideas every two minutes. But get her to observe the team and observe how well you guys are following the norms, about how well you're following the agenda, about how effective you've been, and you will notice that person starts to learn a lot about the rest of the team and become a better contributor. But instead of picking on her and saying, it was Hamish who's always talking, instead of picking on Hamish, the first week Hamish has a go and then rotate it around your team. It's the most powerful thing I've ever seen. When I was involved in a principals group, and we sat down as a group before, and one person talked, and the other one listened, and the other one had to write notes, just watching the person bite their tongue who couldn't talk because they thought they had to contribute. Encourage our teachers to be listeners, and this is a good way to do it. If you haven't gone to this toolkit, man, I suggest you go there, Adaptive Schools. Can I have a show of hands those who know about Adaptive Schools? That's not many. So Adaptive Schools has a myriad of different protocols that will help you to be more effective in your team meetings, because it's that time that is critically important, whether it's your staff professional learning or your teams meeting regularly, you want that to be more successful. So have a look at Adaptive Schools. Okay, so, got student-centeredness sorted. Your school understands that? Brilliant. <laughs> got shared beliefs and understandings. Got skill development. Got support for staff to transition to more collaborative ways of being, or if you're in a co-teaching school, to be more effective at co-teaching. Got structures school-wide that have changed to enable collaboration. Hopefully, in your schools, and I'm gonna to go to whether or not, oh, sorry, I'll ask again, because a different group. How many of you have got schools that are flexible learning spaces? And how many of you got traditional classroom schools? Okay, so the answer should be the same for both groups. Can you have a conversation with the people at your table, what you've done and what you know to make the environment and the third teacher in your school consistently, consistently across your school? Have a conversation about that. When you're building the bottom of your foundation for your, your pyramid there, one of the most important things you can do is to have a look and see how your environment has been the third teacher. And if you haven't started on that journey, a really simple little publication you can look at is Clever Classrooms from the UK from Salford University. And it gives you just some really simple tips about how the environment can become the third teacher in your school. For example, if your school walls, your classroom walls are full of learning and you have the tall person trip up device, which is wires hanging across the room, and they're covered with learning, then your environment isn't your third teacher, your environment is white noise, verbal, sorry, visual white noise. Kids can't see it anymore, it means nothing to them. I'm, I'm sure it's a sense of pride for the teachers themselves, but I would challenge teachers who have created that sort of environment. I would challenge teachers who are covering up windows because they were designed for a specific purpose, funnily enough, to let light in and let children see out. I challenge that if there isn't specific design, learning designed areas within the classroom. So have a look at the publication if you haven't had a look at it. It's called Clever Classrooms and it's just a starting point if you haven't already figured out about how to make the environment the third teacher. Whether you're in a traditional classroom or a flexible learning space. What I do notice in flexible learning spaces is teachers seem to become far less stressed about displays and they don't spend quite so much time doing it. Which is great because usually it's a waste of time. So I thought that one of the greatest um, two ads we've got in New Zealand is student-led learning, or student-centred learning. Again, a great publication, if you haven't already looked at it, is The Nature of Learning. Can I have a show of hands those who have downloaded this publication? Okay. Whether, no matter what sort of school you've got, no matter what sort of environment, you should have this publication at your fingertips. Because this says to you, 
that your school can be an innovative learning environment no matter what it looks like. Because an innovative learning environment has seven principles that underpin it. But the reason I wanted to share that slide with you is because if we want to have children learning and creating their passions, then we need some time from experiential learning. But it does need to happen all the time, but it does need to happen. And I suspect if it's not happening, then there is no student-led learning going on in your classrooms. Now, I think this is the bit that teachers are find trickiest but actually, I suspect children will learn wonderful things if you just let them go for it sometimes. Now that national standards have gone, you could just get back into exciting learning with your children and see how well they do with their numeracy and their literacy because they're passionate about something. So in the nature of learning, they're not, they're not suggesting don't have guided learning. So don't, have, don't not have deliberate acts of teaching, but make sure children have an opportunity to have experiential learning. Here's the seven principles that would be evident in any school, no matter what shape, configuration, or classroom setup, that is an innovative learning environment, and everyone in the room should be wanting to have one. Because this defines what quality teaching and learning, they, they examined schools all around the world, and they said these are the environments that are best supporting children to learn in the 21st century. So again, if you haven't got it, have a look at it. When you come to your conversations about what effective pedagogy is, and your shared beliefs around teaching and learning, please don't say to your teachers, let's sit down and have a conversation about what effective pedagogy is. Give them some starting points and then use some protocols to do some readings around this stuff and start to reconceptualise what the learning environment can be like in your school. In other words, if I ask you this question, I should see every hand in the room go up, do you have an innovative learning environment? And the answer should be yes and it shouldn't matter what sort of building you've got. Maybe if I reframe that, would you like to have an innovative learning environment? Are you working towards one? It should be yes. So, what indicators do you have that you're moving towards a student-centered learning environment at your school? What indicators do you have? I'll put that slide back there so you can have a look and have a conversation. It's the last chat before we finish. What indicators do you have that you're moving towards a student-centered learning environment or an innovative learning environment at your school? Okay, I'm going to finish up with a protocol, a protocol to help you and your school, if you haven't already done this, gain commitment for collaborative action, so positive change, um, improvements in your school, and it's called the 1-5 protocol, and it's pretty simple, really. Um, what, what I did at the beginning of the year is I noticed that at the school that there was not a particular positive feeling towards um, team meetings or towards literacy, as it turned out, towards a whole lot of things. So we gave them some stickies. Each staff member had five stickies, and they had to write one word, if at all possible, about what your feelings or behaviours are if you go into a meeting. So it could be a literacy meeting, it could be a team meeting, any collaborative meeting that you have at school. What are the feelings or behaviours that you see or feel at the moment? They do those five stickies. Then, again, one word stickies, where would you want it to be one year from now? What would ideal look like in your school? What would ideal team meetings look like or staff meetings? You just pick whatever is working or not working well enough in your school. And then the great bit was how will we get there? So how does it feel at the moment? What are the behaviours you're seeing? It's really funny because people poke holes at other people. You know, I see disruptive behaviour, grumpy behaviour, rolling of eyes. That's great. Write them all down. Preferably one word, but two will do. Where would you like it to be in 12 months and how we get there? This gave me such moral imperative for change at Callan Junior School because this is what they told me. They said, oh, our meetings are inconsistent, they're unclear. Someone said, a few people said, oh, sorry, I word clouded it. There's probably a digital way you can do this easier. Yep. Word clouded it. What's it called? Menti. Menti. Use Menti. John knows. This is what they told me about how the meetings were going at the school. This is where they wanted them to be. And what was most important is they said, this is how we want to get there. So this gave me a way that I could bring about change in the school, but by using the teacher's own voice. And that's what led to our schooling improvement teams and our sprint schooling improvement teams, which over two years has created such significant change in our school. So once again, rather than me saying this is the way it needs to be, or your leadership team, 
just get people to voice how they want their school to be different or how they want their teams to be different or better and then hold them accountable to it. What I loved in there was this bit here and it said being accountab accountability and I'm sure what people meant is other people should be accountable. That person should be accountable and that person should be accountable. The great thing is it's said and it stood out so now we can hold everyone accountable and they can hold themselves accountable to make positive change in our school and I think I have to finish there Perry. Thank you very much everyone, that's my time is up.